I decided to kill you with truth with our guys, Nate Jackson and Chad Brown. Now, you were missed last night, Chad, at Avid Caddy, my man. So we understand you have a prick problem. <laughs> Don't we all? Cactus spine problem. Oh, oh yes. I, well, but Not it did, a prick. It did prick you, though, right? I mean, you know, you're dealing with a big prick. Uh, well, that's been a lifelong issue for me for a long time. Hey, nah. um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's... whenever we get on the show with you, D Mac. <laughs> hey, but I'm bada bing, bada boom. All right, so why don't you update us right off the bat? Like, what's going on? What, what's the deal? Uh, the uh, infection that I thought would come seems to have not arrived. Um, I have uh, been in contact with medical folks to give myself a prescription just in case things take a turn for the worst. Uh, the swelling is uh, was pretty bad yesterday, starting to go oh. down now. Okay. So it's difficult to tell. It's like, well, is this trauma because a oh. four-inch cactus spine oh. went through your finger? Or is this an infection? <laughs> kind of difficult to God. triage this bad boy. But uh, I think at this point, it's more trauma than infection not to downplay the trauma um but that seems to be short term the infection seems not to be an issue to be All safe right. to, to be All safe right. did you pee on it just to kind of i did not pee i did not soak it in a bucket of pee this is not a okay. uh a, a jellyfish sting mm. it's not an episode of friends um no this is real life <laughs> with real medical advice and real smart people involved so wait you're you're a snake guy and you know sometimes in the movies you see the guy get bit by the snake and then someone comes and sucks out the poison, spits it on the ground. You're saying that's not a feasible solution to an issue like that? That is definitely not a feasible issue. Do not get your knife and cut an X on the fang wounds and try to suck it out. This is not Gilligan's Island. This is not any other version of some stupid lost movie. Yeah. What do you do? In the realm I mean, of real do do? science. What do you do, Jet? Uh, Chad, if, if uh, you, you apply a tourniquet, if you okay. can, to the area as quickly as possible to limit blood flow towards your heart, mm -hmm. um, even a tourniquet's not going to be 100%. I would suggest, suggest getting some medical attention. No uh, village voodoo treatments, <laughs> no sucking the poison out. Just consult the professionals as that quickly so as possible. No, wait, that doesn't work because I've you've seen that in every TV show and movie forever. <laughs> no, yeah. no, uh, you know, that's that no. doesn't. That, I'd be so fuck Nate if because I would just go to sucking the poison out and spitting it. Okay. Yeah, you spit. You don't want to swallow it. You want to spit it out. You want to get it. You don't want to swallow it. Too Let's what think about doing? this just, just real quick. What are we doing? When was the last time you were frightened by something? Like, oh my god! I saw my I saw a mirror this morning. All right, but in that fright, how quickly did that feeling of of genuine fright get into your stomach? Get into your feet and your legs? When you're frightened, there's an instant release of hormones that your body can feel all the way down to your toes instantly. So to somehow think someone gets bit by a snake, they're going to fall to the ground and go, oh my gosh, I got bit. And you're going to go, oh, let me get my knife out and cut an X and suck the blood out. How much time is that going to take versus the instant body reaction that we feel when we get scared? Our body's very quick at moving fluids quickly. Yeah. Hormones, blood, all that stuff throughout our body. You're not going to beat that system in our body by sucking the venom out and now you know the, the more you know the better you are and yes. and that's what we are with the uh, chocolate pain as as chad is a living example now that being said as we're presented by ed pray the real estate the number one real estate team in colorado and ed and his team were out with us last night at avid caddy so i can't speak highly of a real estate company and a man then actually do buy and sell a home with them. And that is what I have done. And uh, we are renting. Talk about a weird moment, like renting your own home. But we're done with like making the house look fancy. We are in packing shit up in boxes and moving it out. So it's another very odd turn. And thank God I'm busy because my wife is doing all of it. But it couldn't happen without Ed Prather. So thank you to Ed Prather. And thank you, Avid Caddy. Nate, what would you uh, say about the night last night? Avocaddy was a great host, man. It was it was a lot of people there. There was a lot of balls being smacked. Uh, you know, lo long drive competition closest to the pin. We didn't do any of that, but we were set up, and Gorilla set us up there. And uh, Locos Lobster had some awesome lobster rolls. And uh, man, we had some awesome sponsors there. 
and listeners, fans were there. Got to meet some people face to face who who watch us every morning. And, Isn't that and, crazy? Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> and heard a lot of compliments about our show, man. And and just you know, like it's radio and media is weird because you're just sitting by yourself in front right. of a mic. Or right. and in the case of this podcast, we're sitting alone in our house. Like we don't get to interact. With, we were interacting with each other. Right. But back when we were in the radio together, we'd see each other face to face. We don't even do that, right? right. So right. last time I saw you, D Mac, face to face was probably when we were what like working together. Uh, well, since we've been doing this and, you know, we figured out. Oh yeah. Yeah. We got together for a while. Yeah. But... And you know, I wish we could still do that, but logistically it's just, it was, we tried, we did it for like a month and I, it's, it's incredible what efforts we went to, to do that. Yeah. Um, but, but this is just better. It's more efficient. Yeah. It's just better period. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was, it was awesome. Awesome evening. Uh, I got to eat two dinners cause I ate dinner before I came and then I got to eat the lobster roll. And um, shoot, I mean, Brandon Cristal was there and uh, David Bruton was there and we just got to hang out, man, and, and talk some smack. And uh, it was a good time. We missed you, Chad. Oh, yeah, we, we definitely that. missed you. And we had, you know, the game was a snoozer. So we ended up, uh, Nate, and uh, the me, BK, and, and you and Brute, we talked about football, Chad, for the vast majority of the time we were on there because that's just where the conversation sort of led us. And it was interesting talking about the hierarchy of, who you are in football once you get to the NFL. Um, I thought that was interesting, Nate. Um, it, it was a true meritocracy. Once you get into an NFL locker room, who gives a shit about where you're from or who you represent? While there might be a little smack talk amongst uh, teammates when it comes to college stuff, at the end of the day, I, I mean, you know, and I, I didn't know if that was really the case, but, but you know, Nate, that's what you and Dave said. I'm, yeah, you're 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 an undrafted guy from Menlo College. <laughs> He's at Notre Dame, but who gives a shit once you're in the locker room, right? Yeah, yeah. So what DMac was saying, Chad, was like he thought that like if you go to Miami or USC or something, then the expectations are higher of you in the locker room than guys who didn't go to you know more prominent schools. And, and at least my experience was now, nah, man, like you're, you're the expectations are that you're going to perform at a high level every single day. And your worth is judged based on that, your ability to help this team and to play to the standard that's created by the coach. And they don't, I mean, we didn't talk about where you went to school. The only time we talked about where you went to school was like, you know, when one guy's team was playing the other guy's team that week, they were talking shit or betting on it or whatever, but there was no like, Hey man, this guy went to USC. He's going to be better than the dude who, you know, there was none of that uh, in my experience. What about you, Chad? I would have to say there is a little bit of uh, expectations from the, from the from the big college guys. You went to this big school. You should know how to do this. You went to you went to Texas A and M. You went to Alabama. You should have this drill down. We shouldn't have to explain it to you. So there's a little bit of that. And for the you know the John Randalls of the world, Texas A and M Kingsville. Who has even heard of that spot? Of course, John Randall went to the Hall of Fame. Um, so I'd imagine he was given a bit more grace because he was a small school guy of, you know, learning some of the drills and all that. But once you, the further you get from your rookie, the further you get from the start, the less and less that matters. Um, so, yeah, I'd say by halfway through year two for anybody, the meritocracy supersedes any expectations based on what school you went to. And then, that, then it's probably removed after year three. You're an NFL football player. You're supposed to know how to do this. It doesn't matter where you went to school. Now, here's what we did get into that was interesting. So you wipe away the college stuff, so who cares? But Nate and, and David both agreed that you can fall into some stereotypes once you get into the NFL based on what you're doing, especially with Dave and maybe you to a, a lesser degree, Nate, uh, special teams. Definitely with Bruton. I mean, that, you know, he he was good at it. He got in on it, and then he just couldn't – he kind of couldn't shake it. And while it was great because it kept him in the NFL, no doubt about it, like we discovered last night, um, last night, Nate, talking to him, it was frustrating for him because you want to be viewed as more than. And for you in particular, Nate, you had to change to a different position, period. A and with the changes in special teams now, it would be a more difficult spot, maybe – for guys like you and David just to be on an NFL team because things have changed so radically with kickoffs. Yeah. No player goes into the NFL thinking I'm going to be, I want to be a core special teams player. 
Right. You go into the NFL thinking you're going to be a starter, you're going to be a pro bowler, you're going to you know play 10 years and, and contribute on offense or in defense like you did in college. Very few guys get to the NFL based on their special teams play in college, right? Most guys are badasses in college on offense or defense. They get to the NFL, they realize, okay, there's a guy ahead of me here, and if I'm going to make the team, I have to play special teams. And so a lot of these guys, most of them learn special teams, some more than others, when they get to the NFL, I was certainly that guy in college. I didn't play special teams at all. I mean, right. there was one year where I was playing a little bit of it. And then once I, you know, <laughs> once I became a, a, a key figure on our offense, our coaches didn't want me on there. Right. right and right. so, and so I got to the NFL and all of a sudden, Oh, oh I'm not going to be catching 15 passes a game here. I need to, I need to do something else. Right. And then, and then if you play well in special teams, then your special team coach really starts to trust you and rely on you and really rally for you. Right. And what David Brew was talking about last night was his special teams coaches were like, nah, we need you here. Like, I don't want you on defense, you know, because when you're, when you're playing, when you're playing all the special teams, kickoff, kickoff, return, punt, punt, return, we called it the big four. That's about 25 to 30 plays a game. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good chunk. And, and special teams plays when you become a reliable special teams player, Coaches on both sides love that because they know that they can implement their game plan more effectively. They know they're not going to be put in bad situations. You know, they're not going to give up a big play on special teams that you want reliable dudes on special teams so that you can predict sort of how the game's going to go a little bit better and not be caught out of pocket by a, a return that goes for 50 yards or, you know, vice versa. So, um, so David Bruton, while, he, and I know the feeling I wanted to be playing more offense as well, but I ended up playing those big four, um, it's a niche. It's a niche. What is it? Niche or niche? niche. I'm not a, I'm not a niche. niche guy though. I mean, I'm, niche not, I'm just... a niche guy as well, but yeah. I, I, I've had this discussion literally five times in the last week. It is niche, not niche. Even if you go to Google and make it do the audio saying of it, it's niche, not niche. You've had this conversation five times. Why did you, week? why did you have this five times? Because I own a niche shipping company. <laughs> we, we do niche shipping for reptiles, for aquatics. For invertebrates, for wait, floor. wait, wait, hold on. Slinging reptile semen is a niche business, really? Is a niche is a very, very niche business. Wow. So wow. I had to have this conversation, and I've literally asked everybody at the end of these conversations, "Am I saying that right?" And they're like, "No, you're not." And so eventually, somebody pulled up Google and, and you know, like played it, and I was like, "Oh, okay, wow. it is niche, not niche." You know, Chad didn't have to play special teams, Nate, until like year. Whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. You pump your brakes, pump your brakes, young fella. Young man. Yes. So I played special teams all throughout college. Coach Mack at okay. CU, he was the coach of the punt team. There was a reason why our punt team, the altitude certainly helped. But we were one of the number one or number two or three punt teams in the country every single year yeah. because it was typically – 10 starters or at least eight or nine starters and an all American punter. So all throughout college, I played special teams, particularly early on. And then when I got to Pittsburgh, it wasn't until year three oh. when I got taken off of two of the big four. And okay. then year four, I was off of all special teams because I was a stud outside linebacker doing stuff, getting sacks. Yeah. But I played a lot of special teams in my career, even in new England. And one of my proudest moments in all of my football careers after I was essentially benched for Teddy Bruschi and the first time ever in my entire football career, I'm getting dressed in the locker room. Uh, Dean Pease, yeah, linebacker coach, yeah. walks in and says, hey, man, uh, you, you didn't know? No, of course I didn't know. That was a thing in New England. You didn't know? They didn't tell you? No, you, no, I don't know. No what? We're going to deactivate you for this game. Oh, oh uh, my What are you talking God. about? I've been doing this oh my for 12 God. years, dog. I'm oh a starter. I'm leading the team in tackles, and you're going to bench me? Not wow. just bench me. Deact I went from starting to being deactivated the very next week. Wow. That's a that's a rough one. So what did you so, do when you got deactivated? Did you damn. go and uh, did you go and get your conditioning in and then put your sweats on and drink some coffee and some hot chocolate and some eat some sunflower seeds like I did? No, I uh, <laughs> got my workout in and and they were like, well, you can go watch the game up in the press box. I was like, fuck that. I'm going yeah, home. No. You I went home? home? I was you like, went home? Yeah, get a pizza. I'm coming oh. home. I ain't, I'm not going what? to the press box. And I'm the diva. I'm the diva. Wow. <laughs> you, went, you didn't just hang around to be in the... You went home? I went home. How did that go over? 
No, it was no one said anything. No one gonna say he's been playing for 12 years. No one's gonna say shit. They were allowing me a little bit of grace to, to feel yeah. my feelings. They understood oh that he was God. about to have that reaction, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. they know. Like the my third year in the NFL, I was that was my transition to tight end year, and that I was inactive for most of those games. I think I was only active like five, five or six games that year. So yeah. it became a common thing for me to walk into the to the locker room that year and then the guy Chris True Love was his name who would tell us if you were up or if you were down there was always guys on the bubble so there's 53 dudes on the team 45 suit up for each game so literally eight guys who conceivably could be healthy and had, could have been practicing all week right. don't end up suiting up for the game i think it's a fucking stupid rule by the way why not it's just suit so, up why oh, not just suit totally up all 53 great. what is what is the why you know you're no an FLPA idea. guy chad why do they do that I've yet to see any compelling argument as to why they do it. You're paying these guys. Yeah. Right. Now, some of the guys may have a, a per game roster bonus if you're up or you're down, if you're active for the game. But, in, you know, with the salary cap being what it is, Give we're talking, break. you know, less than a million bucks, I'd imagine, in bonuses for all those eight guys because they're bottom of the guy, bottom of the roster guy. So, right. again, I've yet to hear any reason that makes sense to me. Yeah. So I'd walk in, but sometimes I wouldn't know if I was up or down. Um, and so I would walk into the locker room and I'd wait and I'd look for Chris. day of the game, day of the game, day two hours before the game, three two hours. And a half oh, hours before the game. Oh, you would have to prepare for as if I was playing. And then I'd go in and he'd tell me you're down or you're up. And wow. then I'd go get, you know, get ready and go out there. Now, yeah. now this is, uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell this story because like, okay. So there are some folks who like to, before the game, have that release in the hotel the night before the game, right? I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. I like to keep it in there. I like to keep it in my in my scrot where it's where's where I'm more powerful, right? Okay, Tiger. This one game, the, I th I was sure I wasn't playing. Yeah, it was positive I wasn't playing because <laughs> I had been told that, right? So I handled it <clears throat> the night before, and I might have handled it the morning right before getting on the bus too. Okay, <laughs> and I get on the last bus, and so I'm you're feeling like, relaxed. Oh, I mean, I'm just I'm just ready to go do 10 100s, get a little live, have some donuts, and watch my boys play a football game. Right? Jacksonville. <laughs> And then next thing, next thing I know, I walk in and Chris is like, Hey man, Lou hurt his hamstring in warmups. You're up. And I'm like, wow. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so I went out there and, you know, I had to basically, I was on every special team. I didn't play a lot on offense. Uh, I felt pretty sluggish out there. I felt like I just came <laughs> twice, uh, which I did. So it was, uh, it was unfortunate. I learned a good lesson there. You never know. <laughs> Stay prepared. Stay prepared. Don't yeah. release. All right. Oh so my god, door. dude, that's so funny. What, what was Go your pregame uh, pre uh, um, release ritual, Chad? Did you have one? Um, I like to be light on my feet, um, yeah. but in a different way. I, that was this was more coming out the back than the front. So I like to keep that part, the front part, in for my anger and and my. Uh, um, but I also want to be as. Uh, I want to clear my intestines out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Take the world's cleanest and biggest dump so I could be as light <laughs> on my feet as possible. What? That was very important to me. Very important to me. As a guy who actually has pooped on himself at least once or twice <laughs> during a football game, you don't want to be trying to hold something in while you're tackling uh... the quarterback or you know taking on a 330-pound offensive tackle. You want to be clear back there. But to go back to my story, I think it was that uh, Wednesday I went to Belichick's office. I was like, hey, man, I need a role to play. Give me something. So then I started playing special teams in year 13 of my career. And so, yeah, the special teams thing is uh, it starts up early. You can become a starter. It goes away. And then at the end, it comes back. Um, yeah. One yeah. more uh, one more on this point. So, uh, you know, sure. every athlete has his own his or her own rituals when it comes to pre-game or pre-competition <laughs> e ejaculation or whatever so, so so football players whatever like boxers and swimmers will abstain for sometimes weeks prior to a competition or a match esports gamers will abstain from sex their entire life <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll just keep on abstaining afterwards that's how much they're dedicated to their sport, oh dude right? you gotta put that in your stand-up routine I, I, it is in there oh okay <laughs> Sometimes we talk about stuff and it just walks me right up to the doorstep of a joke I've already written. <laughs> That's that great. Fun. That's great. Hey, hey, have you oh, ever had man. sex with a tech worker? Look, put it this way. There's a reason why they call it Microsoft. Okay. There you oh. go. Okay. Not over. a lot of RAM speed in the hard drive, if you know what I mean. Gotcha. Boy, you could be here all night. Tip the wait staff. <laughs> Try the veal. Um, the Broncos have a little bit of news. Um, they're having some visits. 
And it, it, you know, the visits are, they are what they are, but it does give you a little bit of an indication what they may be looking for, if not the specific player and maybe the specific player, but at least the position. And so they had in Texas running back kickoff returner, Keelan Robinson for his top 30 visit. He's five, eight and uh, five, eight and three eights, probably close to my height, five, seven, but whatever. 191 ran the 40 and four, four, two pretty fast for a running back. Uh, two years at Alabama, three at Texas, three TD receptions in 2022. You know what's amazing about guys of this size? Um, smaller guys, obviously, small dudes. Um, but everybody in training camp loves those guys, don't they? Those are the darling dudes, the, the short, undersized dudes who are quick and fast. And it's just like they are camp favorites, Chad. And I don't know if that plays well <laughs> in the locker room. Again, it probably doesn't matter. Like, you know, you can do what you can do. But every single year, there's a short little fast guy, like a little water bug that gets everybody's attention. Why do you think that is? Because there's short little water bugs and during training camp as NFL you know, gets further and further away from the days of Nate and I, contact is less and less a part of it. Yeah. So that guy actually excels because it's basketball on grass until real football is played. And then there's a reason why. You know, that guy is going to be drafted in late rounds or possibly not drafted at all because the size thing matters. Yeah. The NFL is a big man's game. It is a young man's game and it's a big man's game. Those are two truisms that just simply don't go away. And while there may be an occasional exception to that, these short, small little water bug guys, at some point, the, just the sheer physics of it all catches up with you. Right. They're forearm length, trying to hold the football. They're more prone to turnovers. We've seen this with the, these little dudes in the past with the Denver Broncos. So, yeah, you look great in training camp. Then once the physical aspect of the game comes around, you're just most likely going to be just too small to have any long-term success. Yeah, yeah and the Broncos and, already have that guy too. I mean, they got Julian Lafon at running back, and they got Marvin Mims as a kick returner who went to the Pro Bowl last year as a kick returner. So that's his job, right? Yeah, and and Chad, you're six two and change. Nate, are you six three, six four? What what exactly are you check in? Something like that. Two, yeah. So when you guys would look at the tiny guys in the locker room, Nate, what, what when you saw those dudes, what what did you think? I don't know. They were badass dudes to be in this locker room. Okay. You know? All right. Yeah. All right. All I mean, right. It, 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 it's like Chad said. It's a long road for them, and their and their roles are limited. Like for example, yeah. you know, I I moved from receiver to tight end, and then I played a bunch of special teams. Like these guys can't do that. They can't play a, a variety of special teams. They can return. They may be able to be a gunner. They but they can't even be on kick on kickoff. I mean, because they can't tackle. Right. So you right. know they're not big enough, and their long, arms aren't long enough, and they can't be like so they're so they they're very limited in what they can bring. So they have to be super super dynamic at the couple things they can do. And if not, then they're not going to be up on game day. We talked about that. If they're not starters, if you're not a starter, you got to be on special teams. Yeah. And if you're not one of those guys, then you're not gonna you're not gonna play. And if you're not gonna play, then why keep you on the team? We Chad. call those guys all something. So if it was in yeah. New England, they were all Foxborough. If it was in, in <laughs> with Seattle, it was all Cheney. If it was Pittsburgh, they were all Latrobe. So they're training camp stars. They make the all city team, but they don't make the team. You know, mm. it's, this is how this works. This guy looks great. Now we're playing real football. It's all done. What well, it was Taylor Grimes last year, right in training camp. Good memory. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, he, remember remember at a weekend, yeah. he was he was like yes. running with the starters. It was Taylor yes. Grimes. Yeah. Yes. And then boom, he disappears, right? So, yes. so yeah. because what what do you do with Taylor Grimes? If he if he's if he's not going to be on the field every play, he can't, what's he gonna do? Yeah, and I think this it's it, you kind of roll your eyes at it a little bit. And I have nothing against small guys, you know. I, <laughs> I should be the king of small guys, right? But I, I know it's so limited and yeah, 190 pounds. I mean, I I don't know, guys. You know, it's just like I, I shouldn't weigh more than guys uh, on the Broncos. And I don't now, but I did four months ago. And, uh, you know, uh, it's inspiring. The crowd loves. Here's why I think the crowd loves it. Because they can look at that guy and just for a moment when you're sitting up on the hill, you think to yourself, I could have done that. Yes. If I had to yes. blow out my knee or had that asshole coach or whatever. Yeah. I, I, I think so. I think there's a reason why they're identifiable, uh, Nate. And they're I easy think for the same reason. Sorry. I think for the same reason that people love quarterbacks. 
because quarterbacks yeah. are not the same kind of athlete as all those guys. Right. In fact, your neighbor right. Bill might be able to, you know, throw a football 50 or 60 yards down the field, you know, while he's man in the spatula. There's a lot of dudes with good arms out there who grew up throwing and could stand in a pocket. And that's, I think, why the quarterback engenders so much attention. They are not the same athlete. I mean, if you go in, walk in, into a locker room and see everybody naked, the quarterback does not look like the other guys. You know what I mean? Um, his penis is way smaller. And so <laughs> it's, it's niche. It's niche. And, and if you go watch the offseason training program, the quarterback is not, he's just, they're different type of athletes. And the quarterback has a different skill set. It's about his mind, his vision, and his ability to articulate the, you know, the offense and process it and then throw the football. Obviously, you have to be athletic and have good feet, but nothing compared to the other guys on the field. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's why a lot of folks also just really appreciate the quarterback because they can see themselves in that guy. Yeah, that's true too. Because who goes and uh, in the backyard and says, uh, "I'm going to be a cover guy"? You know, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna run down on punts here. You know that n nobody, does, everybody, no. everybody wants to be the quarterback at some point, yeah, right? Nobody I wants mean, to run. Everyone wants to stand still and then tell someone else to go deep. They do, no yeah. doubt about it. I will tell you, and I'd I'd be interested how you guys see your peers, but the position in terms of just physicality body type that consistently to this day blows me away are outside linebacker pass rushers uh to, to chad me, brown. just tell him to take kind of well and chad were you more of an outside guy or an inside guy in the in the nfl like what what kind of defense you know because it was a little bit different back then but i did what, everything i everything. played every linebacker position possible um yeah. i think most people remember me as an outside linebacker but i certainly played inside linebacker for years and years and years as well well, Chad, would, uh, no joke, Chad would be amongst that position group. And when those, when I'm at practice and those guys walk past me, like it's, it's obviously you see the big tackles and guards and, you know, they're just big physical human beings, but sometimes those guys look kind of dumpy and you don't, you don't, they don't look like the most athletic dudes in the world. Um, running backs are all kind of short and squat and strong and okay, fine. Quarterbacks do look like relatively regular people. And certainly Russell Wilson didn't look like anything special. But when you see these guys, 6'3 to 6'5 at 245 pounds or whatever, who are the most skilled athletically in total guys, that blows me away. The athleticism of those guys in particular, to me, to this day, it, it's a reality check if you never stood next to one of those guys in terms of like, can I really play this game? And the answer is clearly fucking no. Um <laughs> But those are the guys that really kind of I I jot my drop my jaw about Chad Nate. I'm curious how you guys felt about your own peers in terms of physically the athleticism it takes to play a position. Uh, yeah, I, I, the monster defensive ends are the guys who I was just wild at the Julius Peppers of the world to be six six two seventy five two eighty and to do what I did, but even more athletically and even at a higher level while. This, the, the position itself certainly has some of the lengthier athletes who have a good bulk and all that and great athleticism. The true outstanding outliers, I would just marvel at them like, oh, my gosh, you know, I I, I feel like I'm one in a, in a couple thousand, maybe one in a couple hundred thousand. That dude's one in millions. Yeah. His skill set, his size, his reach, his length his pure level of athleticism to go forwards, to go backwards, to run over big dudes, to run with little dudes. That stuff used to blow me away. So, yeah, there are some, even as a Pro Bowl, all pro player, there were players on the field who were just such athletic freaks that I was had that same feeling you had. Yeah, man, genetic freaks, too. I mean, yeah. people would ask me, like, you know, how many of those guys are on steroids? And they got to be on steroids. Look at them. And it's like, nah, man, like, God made these guys that way. It's steroids don't do that. God did that. And then, but, but the cool thing about it is, I mean, if you're an opponent of those guys that you find out that they also, they do have weaknesses. They're not sure. perfect. Right. Right. And so right. I had to block those guys that he's talking about <laughs> oh when I went gosh. from receiver to tight end, which is why that first year I didn't play much because I didn't have the skill set to really mm. handle these guys. But what I learned as the years went on was that I had to use my tools against them and and use what I my advantages which was the quickness off the ball obviously I knew the snap count they didn't right. and I had to basically hit them first and then run my feet and use my technique to try to subdue them long enough for the block to be successful and and 
you know, more often than not, as my career went on, I was able to do that even with these. Yeah, big, yeah of course, yeah. I got my ass kicked. Like we all get our ass kicked in football. Like we'd be watching film and a guy would get dumped and the coach would be Ronnie Bradford. You played with him. He'd be like, hey, if you haven't got your ass kicked, you haven't been playing long enough. It's right. going to happen to right. everybody. Right. So don't right. feel bad about that. This guy is a beast over there. Right. But he but he does get tired. He does have weaknesses and he does have tendencies. And once you figure that stuff out, it can become a mind game and you can win those matchups when you're physically outmatched. Yeah. It like some of the most awesome film you could ever watch was our guy, Alfred Williams in college watching big Al's who was six, six and might have been as athletic. I mean, Al was an incredible pro too. No doubt about it. But I, I think he was just unreal, Chad. And you played along with him in college because I think he was healthier than he ever was and just as athletic at 20 as he was at 26, 27. You know, Al was an amazing pro, but the dominance of Alfred Williams at that position in college was like something I've never seen in my life. I mean, talk about a man amongst boys. It, it was just awesome watching Big Al back then. Oh, it was incredible. It was it must have been incredible, incredible to practice and play with them, too. It must have been unreal to be yeah. like, and even the Canavis guy on the other well, side, Canavis yeah. McGee, who was probably bigger and faster and was well, definitely stronger than, than Alfred. Both those two guys were just amazing physical yeah. freaks. So to you know be at practice and see what they were able to do day in and day out. Mm. Uh, Alfred was just such an am- natural athlete. Yeah, that he was just walking on the football field, was just better. Than almost everybody we faced every single you game. Know, and people don't know, Nate, you might not know this. Alfred actually was on the CU basketball team. Yep. Oh, and wow. yeah. yeah, and he was to pl- as a player. He wasn't just there to, you know, warm up or whatever. Alfred at age 50 kicked a 50 yard field goal. If, if you guys don't remember that, um, it, it was just, and, but Al hated lifting weights, yep. hated working out the yep. steroids. Are you kidding? Al wouldn't mess around with that shit in a million years. It was just the way he was. And never mind what just an amazing person he is and all that stuff too. So, uh, but, and, and so it's weird to be friends with somebody who was just, and I, I'm blown away by how athletic you guys, but Alfred, if you really, t- there's a reason why he's in the college football hall of fame, just oh, yeah. so. And I think if things went, I think if Al was drafted by the Broncos and he wasn't, Mike Kroll was out of Nebraska. And while Mike Kroll had a great rookie year, it was ultimately a flop. It was a mistake by the Broncos. They should have Huge. taken Alfred. Huge. I think I think if Alfred was drafted by the Broncos, Chad, he would have been in the Hall of Fame. How about that for a hot take? What do you yeah, think about yeah. that? I played with Mike Kroll when he got when he bounced around and got to Seattle. Mike Kroll was nowhere near the player Alfred Williams was. And for Al to start there and rather than Cincinnati, Cincinnati was awful. It was the worst place right. in the league to go. And it sucked the the heart and fun out of the game for Alfred for a long time. So, you know, I was happy he ended up with the Broncos, but to start there when they were just the worst franchise, they had to pay for jocks. You know, it was ridiculous. They didn't have Gatorade for the guys. That's how awful an organization they were. Wow. Do you know, there's a great story, and I don't know if it's true or not, but Al's told it several times that he, he's he got a very interesting relationship with Eric Bieniemy. I I do believe they're friends, yes. I think. They are. Um, they are. But it's a weird little friendship because there's some really odd moments. And one of the classic stories is Al knew he was leaving Cincinnati. He was getting out of there. But he told Biennemi, yeah, come to Cincinnati. I'll be there. So Biennemi <laughs> signs a deal with Cincinnati only to find out Alfred's bouncing from the Bengals. And Biennemi was pissed off at Al like, you, you're leaving me here. And I was like, yeah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> I got jokes. <laughs> I mean, it was – anyways – and you know, it's funny, though, to wrap this conversation up, though. Harold Hasselback once told me the dumbest people are outside linebackers. He mm. said they're they're the physical freaks. Right. But are also they're stupid because it's just like ball snap, get quarterback. Now, to do that, it takes a very special athlete. But to just react like that. Um, and I don't know. Now, this is coming from Harold, who was an outside linebacker, too. So I don't know if you agree with that, Nate, or not. Uh, Chad, I don't know if you agree with it, but that's what Harold Hasselbeck once said. Well, Harold Hasselbeck, number one, rest in peace, Harold yeah, Hasselbeck. Yes, yes. Um, there's something to be said for the edge guy who just goes after the quarterback. If you play it as as it was played in my day, where you had to drop into coverage, where I slid into played inside linebacker, there was yeah, certainly I had to have a lot more mental responsibility. Yeah, but that hardly ever happens these days. These I days, mean, no, they're just no. they're just go after the quarterback. So they're 
their football IQ is just so low, not because they're dumb because of their body. They're just not asked to do much. If you go after quarterback and you make sure if somebody runs the ball, it goes inside. And that's all you got to do. So then your physical skill set comes to the forefront, not your technique and your knowledge of the game. So these guys are kind of dumb by process rather than by who they are. Nate? You're, you're, you're muted. Oh, you muted yourself, Nate. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, if you think about it, there's not a lot of edge players who end up in the media, in sports media, <laughs> other, other than Chad. Yeah, that's a riot. Well, no, it's just because they don't learn of they, that. They don't learn the big picture, right? They don't right, under, right. understand it quite as well. I mean, Chad is the anomaly in more ways than one. <laughs> you guys are the best. All right. Um, well, there you go. Um, in lieu of big Broncos news, um, which is coming down the road, it's always great to have football conversations with you guys. And we thank Ed Prather, the number one trusted real estate team in Colorado. He'll sell your home guaranteed, just like he did for your pal, D. Macko. And uh, I shaved the beard. What do you think? Really it's sexy. Good. I mean, really. Come on. Off the charts, D. Macko. Looking great, man. You can sort of see a chin. Sort of. Almost. Kind of. Yeah, almost. All right, boys. We'll talk to you tomorrow. We kill you with truth as we chuckle at pain. <laughs> see you. Peace. Bye.